In this series, I'll walk you through all the steps for designing a race car suspension. Now that we're done with the kinematics, in this episode, we'll focus on designing together the springs and anti roll bar. Hello everyone, this is Bruno. Now that we're done with the kinematics, in this episode, we'll design together the springs and anti roll bars that we want to use in our GT3 race car. Before we start, let's do a quick recap of what we've done so far in the series. If you remember well, we are creating together a case study, which is a GT3 front suspension design. We started by designing the outer pickup points, inboard pickup points, and all actuation pickup points. Now we are done with kinematics, and we can focus on the next step of the process, which is designing springs, anti roll bars, and dampers. So for this case study, it is important to know that the values that we are using are only examples. They are not recommendations. Besides that, there are obviously many parameters that we are not taking into account since this is just an exercise. As you can see, for each step of the process, we documented the whole thing and you can get access to all of these notebooks in the video description. So how do we start defining and designing the stiffness and damping characteristics of our car? Well, as we've discussed in the previous episodes, we start by defining the outputs that we would like to achieve. So in this documentation page, we have defined many of the characteristics that we would like to achieve, such as natural frequencies, row gradient, pitch gradient, row stiffness distribution, and so on. And if you're interested in knowing many details how to determine these numbers, you could be interested in our seminars. But before we analyze all of these numbers, let's have a look at the overall architecture, overall methodology that we should follow when designing these components. So this schematic will give us a very good idea. First, we need to define what ride, heave and pitch behavior we expect from our car. How do we define that? Well, there are a few key metrics that we should be determining. For example, what is the natural frequency of our suspension? What is the maximum deflection that it could achieve? Or even what is the pitch gradient that I expect this type of car to have? Well, now that we have this defined, we can then calculate our spring stiffness. And later on, I'm gonna show you how to do that. Once you have your springs defined, the next step is to determine your anti bar stiffness. And in order to achieve that, first, you need to have your springs determined. And second, you need to also define what is the roll behavior that you expect from this type of car. For example, what is the roll gradient? What is the roll stiffness distribution? With this information, you are able to calculate your anti bar stiffness. Lastly, you also have to define what is the expected behavior of your vehicle under high loads. So for example, very high speeds or heavy braking. Do you want your car to behave differently? If so, then you should be designing your bump stops. All right, so enough of the overview. Let's tackle each of these specific areas in details. So the first one, as you can see, we always start by defining the spring stiffness that we would like to use. So if we expand a little bit further in this calculation block for the spring stiffness, this is what we would have. Again, we need to determine the ride, heave and pitch behavior that we would like to, to see. For example, by defining a natural frequency that is appropriate for this car. With this information, we are able to calculate first the wheel rate, and you know that the wheel rate is basically the stiffness as seen on the suspension, as you compress the suspension and extend the suspension, instead of looking directly at the damper. Once you have the wheel rate calculated, if we use the motion ratio that we found in the previous episodes, you can convert that into spring stiffness. So first thing, there are a few different ways of calculating the wheel rate. We could, for example, have a target natural frequency of the suspension. In this case, we are disregarding the tires or we, we can define a target maximum displacement at peak load. That, let's say that we want our suspension to only move 30 millimeters at peak load. Then we also can calculate what wheel rate is needed to achieve that. In our case, we're going to focus on defining a spring stiffness from a given natural frequency. How do we define what natural frequency we want? Well, it depends on several factor, factors. The first one is that each type of car will have a range that you typically see natural frequencies. This is a good reference and a very good benchmark for you to start designing your first car. If you have a higher natural frequency, this means that we'll have less movement. You are going to better control your platform. You will transfer load faster, which is good for high level um, race cars as well as pro drivers. If you go to the lower end, then you have a slow, slower weight transfer. You have more suspension movement, but at the cost of more platform movement. So your car is pitching more, it's moving more. So your aerodynamics is shifting more as well. 
So in this exercise that we're designing a GT3 car, I selected a front natural frequency of 3.5 and a rear natural frequency a little lower of 3.1. And why is that? Because the front suspension is a lot more sensitive in terms, in terms of aerodynamics to ride height variations. So I would like a little bit higher frequency, meaning a stiffer suspension in order to better control that. Okay, now we have defined the final output, natural frequency. How then we reverse engineer and find the spring stiffness from there? And then we find this equation over here. If you notice, each step of the process has a different color. So for calculating wheel rate, it's blue. So you can come to the blue section for the calculations. When we're calculating spring stiffness, it's yellow and so on. This is going to be valid for this entire document to make it easier for you to review by yourself later on. All right, so once we apply this equation, we can calculate that in order to achieve a frequency of 3.5 Hertz, we need a wheel rate of 139 Newton millimeter. Please be very careful with units when using these equations over here. That's why we have the units also specified. Okay, once we have the wheel rate defined, we see that we need also the motion ratio coming from previous episodes in order to calculate spring stiffness. We also saw in previous episodes that the wheel, that wheel rate is basically spring stiffness divided by motion ratio squared. If you swap things a little bit in this equation, we can calculate that the spring stiffness needed in order to achieve a wheel rate of 139 is 257 Newton millimeters for the motion ratio we have. In summary, if we use a spring of 257 Newton millimeters in this suspension with a given motion ratio, we are going to get to the natural frequency of 3.5 that was our initial target. Done, we have the springs defined. Another approach you could take to calculate spring stiffness is to look at the maximum displacement you would like to see on the suspension or on the damper. In the critical case, let's say that you have lots of load transfer with braking, with cornering, and then you are also hitting a curb. You can calculate what is the maximum load, and given this maximum load, you can calculate how much spring stiffness you need in order to keep this movement under control. If you would like to use that approach and ideally compare both of them, you can review all of the equations written here for you. Springs, done. If we go back to our initial schematic, we can see that the next step is first to define what is the roll behavior we would like to see in our suspension. And from there, we can calculate the anti-roll bar stiffness needed to achieve that. Now, let's expand a little bit more on the anti-roll bar calculation block. Well, this is the reasoning that we should follow. It is very straightforward, even though we have lots of blocks over here. If we first we define the roll behavior expected, let's say that we define a roll gradient. We know how much the car rolls for each degree of G, because this is the definition of roll gradient, roll per G. So in this case, let's say that we want the car to roll 0.5 degrees for every G of lateral acceleration. Okay, this is a degree, this is an angle measurement. It's not very easy to calculate the entry bar from there. So let's try to convert that into stiffness. All right, in order for the car to have the roll gradient of 0.5, what is the roll stiffness needed for that? This means that we need to calculate the total roll stiffness, being it from springs or into roll bar, all of them at the same time. Now that we know the total roll stiffness of both front and rear axle, we want to calculate the entry roll bar separately. So let's understand how much roll stiffness we want on the front axle and how much roll stiffness we want on the rear axle. For that, we need to define what is the roll stiffness distribution. But how do we define what roll stiffness distribution we want? Well, there is no clear rule in order to do that. It will be based on experience, based on previous iterations of the car, based on other decisions you make. What are the tire selections front and rear? What is the weight distribution front and rear? And so on. A good starting point could be a number between 1% to 5% higher than the weight distribution. Let's say that our weight distribution is 50%. A good starting number could be to have the roll stiffness distribution starting at 55%. But again, there are no clear rules here what number you should use. In any case, in our example, we are going to assume, assume a number of 57%. So if the total roll stiffness is whatever number we calculated and 57% should be on the front axle, we can calculate how much roll stiffness we have on the front and how much roll stiffness we should have on the rear. Again, this comes from both springs and entry bars at the same time. Well, but here it's where things get easy because we already know how much roll stiffness we would like to have on the front axle. 
And remember that we already calculated the springs, so we can calculate how much row stiffness is coming from the springs. If we know the total row stiffness, and we know how much is coming from the springs, the only component missing is how much is coming from the end row bar. So if we do total row stiffness minus row stiffness from springs, the only thing left is row stiffness from the entry bars. And there you go, we have the front row stiffness from the entry bars. This is at the car level. Now we need to convert it to the component level. How do we go from car level to component level? We use the entry row bar motion ratio. From here, we already have the final front entry row bar stiffness. We can repeat the same and also find it for the rear. Okay, so this gives you a very good big picture or understanding of the process to come from row behavior target to the specific component and row bar stiffness. Now let's look a little bit at the calculations. First step, we go from row behavior to total row stiffness. How do we do that? We have the row gradient equation and if we isolate the row stiffness from this equation, we can calculate the row stiffness needed in order to achieve this row gradient. Right, first step, done. Next step, now in green, light green, we have front row stiffness. How do we calculate that? Basically, we have the total row stiffness multiplied by the row stiffness distribution we determined together, 57%. And there you go, we have the row stiffness that should be coming from the front axle. Next step, we should calculate the front row stiffness that is already coming from the springs that we designed together, now in light red. So the front row stiffness from springs is calculated based on this equation over here. If you want to understand the details of the equations, you should come to one of our seminars. But if we run all of, or if we do all of this math, we come up with the number from row for the number for row stiffness from the springs. Okay, so we have the total row stiffness and we have the row stiffness from the springs. Since they are in series, we can calculate the row stiffness needed from the entry row bar simply as the total row stiffness minus the number that it's already coming from the springs. So we come up with the final number of row stiffness that should be coming from the entry row bar. Lastly, the last step in green, we need to convert from vehicle level stiffness to component level stiffness. And to do that, we use the entry row bar motion ratio. And guys, there you go. We have the final component stiffness. So our front entry row bar stiffness should be 17 Newton meter per degree. We can also do the same calculation for the rear. Now, this means that, again, if we have the front end row bar stiffness defined as this number and the rear end row bar stiffness defined as this number, we will achieve exactly our initial target for row behavior, given the springs that we have already defined. This is why it's so important the order in which we design stiffness and damping components. Before we move forward, I would like to show you a tool that I personally use. So here we were all doing calculations manually. This is not ideal. It is good for you to do that the first time so that you understand the process. However, this is not the right way to design a race car because it's gonna require so many iterations that you don't want to be doing all this math manually. So you should create tools. They could be very simple. They could be very complex to help you with this automation. So one of the tools that we use, that we, in this specific tool, we try to keep it simple so that it's a very quick um, decision-making tool, is what we call a setup analysis tool. In this specific tool, we can import all of the car parameters for many different setups or iterations, and then we are gonna get hundreds of outputs. So what are the wheel rates? What, what is the row gradient? What is the row gradient distribution? What, what is the suspension row stiffness distribution? So it is very important that we double check that all the calculations we did manually also match the calculations from the tool. So our goal here, let's try two things. Number one, we're gonna try to find the spring stiffness that get, gives us the frequency that we calculated manually. And then we're gonna see if they match. So I start with a front spring stiffness of 200 Newton millimeters. And I have a natural frequency of 3.1, let's say, which is not what we want. Remember, we want 3.5. So we are gonna increase the spring stiffness to 250 and then we're gonna see how close we get to the 3.5 well almost there and then if i use the number that we calculated manually if you remember well it was 257 we're gonna get to a frequency of 3.51 which is pretty much what we wanted to achieve so the next exercise we're gonna do together is again using this tool find an entry row bar stiffness that will give us the row gradient 
and the row stiffness distribution that we were looking at, meaning 0.5 for row gradient and 57% of row stiffness distribution. So the initial number we have is 10 Newton meter per degree. These are the units that we are using for the intro bar. And what we have is, well, first of all, a row gradient of 0.54 meaning that the car is softer than what we would like to have. And the suspension roll stiffness front distribution is 53%. So we would like that number to go higher. So let's try a higher number. Let's try 15 instead of 10. Then we get, okay, something closer to the roll gradient we would like, almost there, and also closer to the suspension roll stiffness front distribution. If we want this number to go higher, we need to increase the stiffness on the front even further. So let's try to use the number that we calculated together, which was 17. Now, if we look at row gradient, spot on, what we were looking for. And then second one, about 57% of row stiffness distribution, which is what we wanted as well. And there's another very important parameter that I'm always looking at when designing a race car suspension, which is, what is the percentage of row stiffness that is coming from the springs? versus the roll stiffness coming from the intro bar. Let's say that you have really soft springs and really um, stiff intro bars. You would have a number of 10% of roll stiffness coming from springs and 90% from the intro bar. Well, probably in this case, you would have really, really soft springs, which you don't really want for a race car. On the flip side, you could have extremely stiff st um, springs, which would compose 90% of your roll stiffness versus only 10% of the roll stiffness coming from the intro bar. This is actually bad as well. Because if you try to tune and adjust the intro bar, even if you change 30% of the intro bar stiffness, the total amount that you're going to change on the whole vehicle is very, very small. So it is important that there is a good balance between row stiffness from springs and front intro bars, so that the intro bars are still effective when making adjustments. So for this design, we were targeting something around 70% of row stiffness from springs and 30% from intro bars, so that the intro bars are still influential on the row behavior. That's what we got for the front. We got 67 to 33, which is good. And then on the rear, we got 75%, 25, which is fine as well. Now that we have the two main components of our stiffness systems defined, springs and intro bars, we can then look at bump stops as well. So bump stops, as you can see here, is a component with a very high stiffness that is not engaged the whole time. You have the bump stop gap, meaning that the suspension can compress a given amount before you engage the bump stop, before you increase the stiffness of the system. So why would you use bump stops? When you're trying to control the behavior of the car differently at low speeds and low load and high speed and high loads, you could be using these components. So for example, let's say that in low speeds you want a very soft suspension so that you have good ride behavior, good ride over curbs and so on. But at the high speeds, you don't want the car bottoming and touching the floor. You want to control that movement. This is when you use bump stops. So when defining bump stops, you have to define two things. Number one, what is the bump stop that you want to use? What is the bump stop curve that you would like to use? And number two, what is the bump stop gap? Meaning how long it should take until the bump stop is engaged. So we're gonna do a quick case study with this GT3 car. So first pick a given bump stop and then pick a given bump stop gap for a specific track. We'll start by defining a specific bump stop that we would like to use. So in a quick case study using this race car, we have bump stop one, bump stop two, bump stop three. So let's try to run a straight line simulation where we add load, add load, add load, and we see how the stiffness or how the right heights of the suspension is changing. So here in the beginning, we have the vertical stiffness of the axle, meaning left plus right, versus the vertical load. So as, for example, we increase the speed or as we brake hard and we increase the load, we can see what the suspension stiffness really is. So here we do not have an, any engagement until we get to about 5,500 newtons of vertical load, which could be, let's say, at 200 kph. And then we start having the engagement. We see that all of them are engaged at the same time because the bump stop gap is the same. And as we compress the suspension more and more, the stiffness goes up because of the non-linear behavior of the bump stops. This is the effective suspension stiffness, but let's look at what really matters in our specific case, ride heights. So how are the ride heights changing differently between these three configurations? Let's say that we define that the minimum ride height we would like to see in this calculation is 20 millimeters, because we know that if it goes lower, then with tire deflection bumps, the car is gonna bottom. What bump stop should we select in order to avoid that we get to 20 millimeters ride height 
add the maximum load of 10,000 newtons for the axle that we defined. Well, it's clear that at least for the gaps that we are using, bump stop one is too soft, as we can see over here. And then bump stop two gives us a better result as well as bump stop three. So in this case, I would select either two or three, and then we can fine tune the gaps, which is what we do now. So we selected bump stop number two, and then we're going to analyze different gaps. 11 millimeters of gap, 14 millimeters, or 17 millimeters. As you can see, the free gap that you have before you start compressing it is increasing and increasing. When we look at the effective stiffness versus vertical load, we'll see, we'll see that the one with the least bump stop gap will engage the earliest and get very stiff, while the other ones are going to take a little longer in order to engage. And if we look at the right height variation versus vertical load, we can see that the case with the highest bump stop gap of 17, we are crossing, we're breaching the limit that we defined of 20 millimeters in terms of right heights for high loads, while the 14 one is at the limit, which is good because we want to be running as low as possible, while the first option, which has a really small bump stop gap, we have a lot of margin over there. So in this case, specifically, I would pick bump stop gap number two of 14 millimeters. All right, so I just gave you a very good idea on how to define at least initially your bump stops and bump stop gaps. Of course, there are a lot of other considerations when you go to specific tracks, what curbs you are using or what sections of the track you want to be touching the bump stops or not. So in this video, we saw how to go from really high level suspension characteristics, such as behavior in heave and row, to defining each of the specific components along the way. So we designed first the springs to achieve the natural frequency we would like, then we moved on to anti row bars to achieve the row behavior and row distribution we wanted, as well as how we keep the ride heights and suspension under control at high loads with the bump stops. Please remember that you can have access to all of these notebooks describing in details each part of the process by going to the link in the video description. If you like this content, you would love our seminars. We offer an applied vehicle dynamics seminar where you get a lot more information in each of the steps of the process of designing the stiffness, damping, kinematics, aerodynamics of your race car, and a whole lot more. And we also offer a performance engineering seminar where we teach you dozens of different data analysis methodologies to maximize the performance of the car you built. Besides that, these are the services that Optimum G offers. We offer vehicle dynamics consulting, where we could, for example, be helping you design the suspension of your passenger or race car, and many other services in terms of vehicle and tire testing, development, and simulation. We also offer performance engineering consulting, where you could have one of our performance engineers at the track with you, applying all of our methodologies. And we also offer simulation software in the areas of vehicle dynamics, kinematics design, and tire analysis. Thank you for watching the video. If you have any questions or comments whatsoever, please leave them in the comment section so that I can get back to you. And I'll see you in the next one.